over 300 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, 35,000 viewers have seen his message, and he is now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. So, everyone, welcome David George Burke, the Burke Burke Gratitude Guy. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Galen, good job. <laughs> I, I've seen Galen before, and uh, he makes a great point, too, about when they introduce you. It's kind of like, who are they talking about? <laughs> gosh, what is up with that? So, but thank you, Judy, for inviting me. And uh, gosh, it's always great to speak to people. I am so thrilled anytime and I feel, I always use the word blessed, that I'm blessed enough to get to do this kind of talk a couple times a week. And it wasn't always that way. It started slow and built up. So, but let me start with asking everybody a question by show of hands here. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? <laughs> thank you. Somebody pointed out to me recently, it isn't just uh, 2008, a lot of that changed. It wasn't just individual or personal, it was businesses, 401ks, money, houses, that type of thing. Well, I will tell you about my personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998, it was a Tuesday. I woke up, I looked over to my right in bed and my wife wasn't there. Thought, That's very strange, I wonder where Dana is. And so just as I'm starting to get out of bed to go look for her, Connor, my four-year-old comes in, he's about this high, where's mom? I said, I don't know, let's find her. So we kind of walk down the stairs, or down the hallway rather. Kyle comes out, Kyle's 14. Same question, I don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms and we go look down the, the stairway downstairs in front of the washer and dryer, here's Dana, face down, kind of curled over, it doesn't look good. So we go running down there and I turn her over and there's stuff coming out of her mouth and Connor starts crying and Kyle's all upset to say the least. I said, go call the fire department, call the medics, call everybody. And in a matter of five or 10 minutes, no more. There was probably 25 people in our house, just teeming with all these fire and medic and personnel. They take her out and they put her into the, uh, the room and they have all these wires and tubes and those paddles, just like you see on TV. Most surrealistic thing I'd ever been through in my life. But what I found that was interesting is they kept working on her and then eventually this little four, short fire person comes over to me and I realized when you're numb, and you've suffered it through a tragedy like there's a potential tragedy, time loses all measure. And she says to me, Mr. Brooke, would you like this to keep working on your wife? We've been working on her for an hour and a half, and she still has no heartbeat. Well, even when you're in shock, the brain's still working to a little degree, and I said, um, I just paused. And I thought, never before in my life if I had to make a life and death decision for somebody. And I thought another minute or two, and I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And what made it so incredibly difficult for me is that wasn't the first loss I'd experienced. My father, pretty doggone good attorney, had committed suicide. My mom had died of cancer. I graduated many years ago from high school in Queen Anne in Seattle. On the night I graduated, two of my best friends, actually my best friend and his brother, car accident, dead. And it just went on and on and on. And I remember thinking at some point, I'm gonna have to figure out how to deal with this. And I didn't know what it was. But I knew I was gonna have to find something. And of all these people that died in my life, what made it so tragic is easily half of the 15 or 20 personal deaths I dealt with were of their own hand. Suicide, pills, booze, crack, it, it's, all, it's all nonsense, but it's a reality. So I noticed after two or three days of going through this shock, where you don't know if this is real or it's a bad dream or whatever it is, you keep thinking you're gonna wake up and you never wake up because it's real. I walked up to the deck and I'll never forget it, even though this is 15 years ago and I looked out in the blue sky I thought, now I see why people kill themselves. I get it. And I remember like two seconds ago going like this. I'm just skin and bone and cartilage. I'm just a little guy trying to get through this crazy thing called life. And I get why people check out. You just walk over the bridge, just step over, you get whatever. My dad got a shotgun. I just, but within about two or three minutes, I sat there by myself and I said, you know what? You're not gonna do that. You're gonna hang around and raise these two guys. And then I, I speak to groups from small to large. I'm very blessed, but it never changes. It's always about 80 to 90% of the people in, their hand, in the room raise their hand. I've been through something like this. 
Well, for me, once you took suicide, pretty touchy subject to say the least, off the table, it's no longer an option. Well, now what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to have to stick around. I'm going to have to figure this thing out. But I realized that what had happened in Dana's case, she died of a prescription pill overdose. 38, as I mentioned. And I remember going up to the treatment center. She had gotten arrested. I've never seen this before in my life. Handcuffs, my wife. She's a beautiful woman, very tall, blonde. Her first date was running Green Lake. She was a heck of a runner. Got hooked on this doggone medication stuff. And this doctor calls me and he says, are you uh, David Brooke? Are you Dana's husband? Yep, come on and sit down. I want to talk to you. And that's about the way he talked to me. I need to let you know what you're up against. Because I've been doing this for 35 years. See all the people in the room? And there's a visiting, so all the addicted people. And they try to make you feel better. He's a police officer. She's an architect. He's a doctor. And I, I know. I, I just really care about the blonde gal over there. That's Dana. I know. I know. Let me say what the stats are. 35 years I've been doing this, as I said. He says one in 20 will make it back to a normal life. This one. Of the other 19 that don't, half of them will be dead within the next year. And Dana was dead about nine months later. That was her third time into rehab. So what it really made me think about is, and I'm gonna ask you about this a little bit later. It depends on how you look at stuff. And one of the questions I'm gonna ask, you can maybe answer it, but maybe more than anything else to yourself. I don't care what we're talking about. It doesn't matter the subject. Gayla made a great point about we're in the workplace, being somebody who says yes versus no. It doesn't matter. But are you the one, or are you part of the 19? And I'll ask you guys that later. I want you to think about it for now. But I'm fascinated by the fact, I will say to people, in different sized groups, how many here think they're the one? Don't do it yet. And like, about half the people raise their hand, just half. <laughs> Wouldn't everybody raise their hand? Yeah. And I go, what's up with you, ma'am? <laughs> I, I don't get it, I, you know. I don't know. But are you gonna be the exception to the rule or are you gonna be somebody who is part of the 19? So I decided it depends on how you look at stuff. So I'd like you to all stand up if you would. And again, kind of like Galen said, I'm not going to make anybody do anything. Come up front. We're going to do a couple little sharing things, but nothing that's going to embarrass anybody. Put your, this is short ceiling. Put your, put your John, you're going to hit the tile. Put your hand up as, as best you can and start turning in a clockwise manner. Now, I noticed already there's no clocks here. So if anybody's in the digital world, here's a watch. So this is clockwise, okay? That's the way it's going. So keep it turning clockwise. Get that nice stretch. You know, it's always good to stand up after a seminar. Now keep it coming down real slowly. Keep it going clockwise. Eyes, chin, chest, waist. Now what direction is it going? Clockwise. Don, go to the front of the class. Kim, good job. Okay, you can sit down. And always, Linda, oh, I love it. I love Linda. There's always somebody that is still doing that. And it makes me feel so good because they kind of, like, you know, like the Amish at Circuit City, like what? Yeah. You know, it's just kind of that. So I've been fortunate enough to know a lot of very educated people, PhDs, masters, all that type of thing. I've had friends of mine that are doctors. Listen, we're buds. That little thing you did with the circle, what's the story on that? Did they subconsciously turn the other direction? I went, no, you idiot. I said, it's looking above and below. Above, it looks like clockwise. Below, it looks like counterclockwise. But it's my way of saying, how do you look at something? Mm -hmm. So once I started to get past this, now I had fraternity brothers say to me, you weren't the same for five or six years after Dana died. What also made it very difficult is not only did she pass away, but because of the addiction, I lost my house, my business, all the money. Why weren't you watching, why weren't you watching the savings account, Dave? I was running, running the business. I didn't know I was gonna have to check it every day when it went from plus to overdrawn one day. Everything we had. But that's what happens. New thing on the east side. I live down in uh, Mill Creek. I just recently moved to the east side in Issaquah. Issaquah paper the other day. All these burglaries, the cops get called and they go there. The laptop and all this kind of stuff. There's even been money and jewelry that's just sitting there. But guess what? The medicine cabinets don't have anything in them. They strip out all the medication. 
So the thing that I want to talk about, there's going to be five things. I like the way Galen kind of set it up. This one I'm going to talk about, and then you talk about it and tell them what you talked about. Embrace gratitude, very, very critical. I love embracing gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Now, I am 63 years old, and I know I don't look a day over 62, <laughs> but I will tell you, I was going to be a speaker when I was 19. Well, that my math tells me that was 44 years ago. Just starting to get it going. It takes as long as it takes. Colonel Sanders started, he's my hero, KFC 63. Walt Disney, 300 banks turned him down. Sylvester Stallone, 300 banks, whatever, sorry, large number turned him down for financing for Rocky. So it takes as long as it takes. And I think you have to adapt that attitude. And one of the things that I notice is that there's something about never giving up. That's kind of a takes as long as it takes slash never give up. Now we've heard that from Winston Churchill. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. People give up all the time. Drives me crazy. This life is a very finite thing that we do. So I really wanted to find something I could embrace and it happened to be gratitude. So Connor was four years old when Dana passed away, as I mentioned. Well, as you might expect, or maybe you wouldn't, but he had difficulty in school. He was in preschool and then kindergarten. So I'm trying to raise my boys by myself. My wife's gone, the money's gone. We had to move in with a friend of mine in an apartment. Lost my house, everything was ridiculous. But what am I going to do? Should I just sit there, wah, wah, wah? No, I'm going to try to figure out how to do something about this. Yeah, it's a sad story. And at some point here in the next 10 or 15, I'm going to tell you how it relates to you guys. Not just my story, but what you can do when you've been through things like this. Gratitude in that gratitude journal is a big chunk of it. But what was interesting, they said, your son's got some problems. We need to take him to a little assessment here. So they go in and they do bouncing balls and all this stuff. And, Connor has a heck of a time. So they go, tell him to go sit in the car. We want to talk to you. Seven or eight hours. So he goes and sits in the car. They sit me down and they go, uh, your son's not right. He's messed up. I said, mom just died six months ago. I know, sorry. That's about how they work. He's messed up. But it got worse. She says, you need occupational therapy. You need special this. You need this. You need you know, all these classes. And we're going to do a special program. They called it in school for people that are messed up. And I said, well, I, I will tell you something. I wasn't a star athlete, but I was a decent, decent athlete. And they said, Connor, we we're living at Green Lake with my buddy, is going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. She starts laughing. <laughs> no, 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 he's not going to be. In fact, he's going to have a difficult time his entire life. He may live with you forever. I'm like, really? So I leave. Walk out into the car, I get in the car, and they did the only thing that seemed logical to me. I burst out into tears and couldn't stop crying for about 20 minutes. Just couldn't stop crying. Mom had just died, I just lost my wife, Kyle was struggling, and now I guess I got a son that's messed up. But I started telling Connor way back then, as I did people when I was still 19, and just doing an occasional little talk, don't give up. I said, Dad, I want to play baseball. Tell baseball, couldn't hit, couldn't throw, couldn't catch, couldn't run. Other than that, he was great. <laughs> Coach Pitch, you know, Diana, is that your name? They're from like here to Diana. How do you, come on. They just, the little ball, Connor couldn't hit it. Ball's here, he'd hit here. Next, T-ball, or maybe that was before. So here's the T, the ball, the ball does not move. It just sits on the T. Connor walks up, can't hit it. He hits above it, he can't, I said, lower. You know, he find, hits the T, the ball falls, dribbles, goes about three, got to hit, got to hit. Dro rolled forward about six inches. But you know, he wouldn't give up. It was horrifying. Maybe that's too strong. He was tough as a parent. And I always feel so fortunate when I get to do talks, whenever I have people come and talk to me afterwards, they always tell me these stories. I related to the thing with your son or your wife or my father or my brother, drugs, whatever. And I'm the one that's fortunate enough to be up here telling it and tell you how I got out of the, the tailspin that it put me in. But Connor, I kept telling him, don't give up. So he kept playing and kept playing. But he wouldn't even play half the time, just be in the dugout. So finally, May 31st, 2005, playing in Little League. Seven to six, the other team, bottom of the seventh. They're up by one. It's a guy in second and third. Two out. Guess who comes out of the dugout? I look over. Oh, here comes Connor. He waves to the stands. Most kids don't even see their dad. He's waving to me. Hey, Dad. 
I'm batting. So I did the only thing that seemed logical. Lord, I would do anything for a walk. Just load the bases. No, hit by a pitch. It seemed like the logical thing to do. Ball one, strike one, ball two, full count. Next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third base line. I don't know how. Rips it down, goes inside the bag, goes in the left field. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second comes in. It's thirds. Heading to home. The ball comes in. The catcher, the guy from third, they catch the ball. They hit the plate. Ball pops out. They win the game 8-7. to seven. Thank you for that clapping. <laughs> Connor is sitting by himself on second base. All by himself. Of course, waving to me, which none of the other kids do. The entire dugout walks out to second base, puts him on his shoulders, carries him off the field. To this day, I still have a hard time getting through that story without choking up. I couldn't talk for about an hour, hour and a half. I'm not kidding you. Lump in my throat the size of a hard mall, I suppose. But we got home that night, and I sat him down in the bed, and after everything he'd been gone through, had gone through with Dana and these teachers telling him he was a loser, I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. It's about the fact you never gave up. You just never gave up. And that's what I think is so important. You just can't give up. And, and again, the stories I feel blessed enough to hear, I don't care how bad they are. The alternative, well, I'm going to jump off the bridge. Pretty much it's uh, terminal. It's over. What did they say once? Permanent solution to a temporary problem. Sad but true line. So what I want to talk about right now, I want you to go back. And Galen, thank you for kind of setting this up. We're just going to take two minutes apiece. I want you to get back in partners again, and I want you to talk to each other, and if anybody wants to mention it afterwards, great, about something that you went through, share it with the other person, just in your partners, that the only reason it ever succeeded is because you never gave up. Okay? So I'm going to give you two minutes each, so break up into your groups. Something that you stuck with in your life that only because you stuck with it got solved. And then we may have some people share. I'll give you two minutes each side. Okay, you guys can wrap up. Thank you. All right, an example of something that by not giving up, throwing in the towel, you succeeded. Would anybody like to share a story? What's your name? Brenda. Brenda, thank you, Brenda. I have a son that's almost 21 years old, and he was diagnosed as rapid cycling bipolar disorder, ADD. You know, I homeschooled him. He got into drugs. He got into all kinds of stuff, robbed my house. And um, two weeks, three weeks ago, I went to North Carolina to visit him. He's had a job for a year. Wow. He's uh, been clean and sober for a year and um, looks better than I could ever imagine. And he certainly wouldn't, if he had those severe psychological issues, he wouldn't be able to be doing wow. what he was doing. And so it was just incredible to go and see him myself. Can we do some applause? Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Brenda. Great example. You know, when you throw in the towel, sometimes the results aren't always uh, what you want. But if you stick around sometimes, boy, it's amazing what can happen. Any others? How about the guy that looks like me? I was going to say, I still haven't figured that one out. <laughs> so I was listening to Diana and Linda talk. So if I, if I ha ask you to put your hand up, put your hand up. And then I've got Diana, and I push. So I've always asked myself, why is she pushing back? <laughs> I didn't say hold my hand back. I just, I'm always fascinated because it's always, I love to hear people share, but I never pick on anybody. But I love to hear the stories, and sometimes the best seminars I've ever been to, and I'm with Diana and Linda talking about what's happened. I'm thinking, the speaker can go home. We want to talk about our deal here. <laughs> you know, it just seems to be so much better sometimes. But, but so thank you, Brenda, and congratulations on your son. I've actually... Um, been lucky. A lot of times, uh, it's it's very intensely personal. My mother was bipolar, a manic depressive, and she used to threaten suicide. And uh, so difficult when you're trying to raise children and the parents aren't setting the kind of example you wanted to set. But I realized that you know, again, we have our own lives. I meet a lot of people that talk about, well, I had this, I had that, and I've heard people say in the seminars they've had husbands or wives that aren't any good. Okay, well, you're not with them anymore. It's your life now. And people will come up to me. I always point to the table wherever my books are, and they, <laughs> sorry. 
And, and um, they tell me about so many times their kids. And it's interesting because I always give out my card and they go, well, you tell the, yesterday, the other day at uh, International District Rotary yesterday, Ryan. I gave her, I said, would you give him my card and ask him, tell him I'd like to get him a latte? One in 10 will take, it, take advantage of it. Maybe one in 20. I always talk about that. But let's get back to that one in 20 for a second because I'm going to quiz you. So you got a big hint on how you're going to want to answer that at some point later in the uh, presentation here. But I've always felt so strongly. In my opinion, Brenda was the one. She stuck with her son and look what happened. And we know around abuse, all you have to do is pick up paper every day, pick up a paper every day and see what happens. Sad. Same thing in those medicine cabinets on the east side. I had this young lady working for me. Tracy, not a real name. She said to me one day, you've been talking to me about this one in 20 forever. This is long before I was a speaker. And I said, Tracy, you need to be the one. You, got, you can't be the 19. You got to be the one. Come on, we had a finite number, amount of time here. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm 63. I'm two thirds of the way through this thing. Holy old cow. It's going by fast. This Diana's age about 30 years ago. It's gone by really quickly. So she says, uh, she's working. I had this auto detail shop I built it. It was going to be a chain. It was very exciting. She informs me one day that uh, she's pregnant. She's like 21. It's by one of the guys in the shop. Gee, that's a surprise. <laughs> I think she'd been an exotic dancer. I'm not really quite sure. There was something there that didn't seem right. And I felt bad for her, but what do you do? You've just got to set the best example as a parent and as a boss. I'm going to talk a little bit about gratitude in corporate America in a little bit, too, for those of you that own your own businesses, which I have a feeling is the lion's share. You've got to set a good example. So I tried to set the best example. You're pregnant. She goes, yep, and they're having the baby. But I'm going to be that one. I'm not going to be the 19. I promise you, Mr. Brooke. I'm going to Texas. I'm going to have my baby down there. My, my mom's going to help me. She leaves. I forget about her. It's about a year later. Frank Legg. And then who's Carrie? James? James? Oh my gosh. <laughs> but wait a minute. Who was on? Was it Carrie? Were you Carrie? One of them. <laughs> I have a big pile right on. <laughs> and it was James? Congratulations, yeah. you two. Congratulations. Can we give him a round of applause yeah. for good ripping skills? <laughs> so I usually save this for later, but I'm going to tell you now because I still haven't gotten over this. I was fortunate enough to be able to write a couple of books and then this gratitude journal which we're going to get to right now but I was talking to Kim about how incredibly tough it is to write a book and the editing and all this kind of stuff and so but I was thrilled when I finally got through it there's still typos and things but you know I'm, you'll see them over there and stuff but but I thought well once you get to this point you should at least sign the book now and so I get this people come and I sign the book and they line up and it's really really very very cool but it's very very humbling because it's not about me that's why I like what Galen said too is that it's about me spreading this message of gratitude and how it can change your life, transform your life. And I just have to tell you about my experiences so I'm not just teaching out of some book. What does he know? He's just teaching out of the uh, anthology series here. But about two months ago, it's like one of these, and I gave it away, and I, I gave him the book, and it was a lot of people. It was like 200 people. And I give her the book, and Sally, and they all clap, and she walks away, and she's about right, not quite where John is. They go, hey, if you like, by the way, later I'll sign that for you. She turns around and she goes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided I'm going to go back and work at Lowe's. Um, <laughs> clearly this hasn't worked. So next module, next thought is a gratitude journal. Embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Never give up. Clear out your brain. Make room for gratitude. A buddy of mine says to me, you need to get a gratitude journal. You're not, you haven't been the same since Dana died. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Wow, that's impressive. I knew this was a smart group. How many have heard of a journal? <laughs> Still a couple. Have you ever seen a journal? Okay, everybody, thank you. So, he says, you need to get a gratitude journal because you are struggling. And I was. And I wasn't going to go jump off any bridge, but... I didn't know how my life was ever going to be the same again. I did go to a support group after Dana passed away for a couple years. Extremely, extremely powerful. Brenda, you mentioned things you went through. When you see other people that nod their heads, when you tell them, I'm depressed, I don't know what the point is, why did this happen, all those things, 
There's phenomenal support in that. And it can be divorce, it can be death, it can be pills, it can be addiction, it can be all these things. But I said, okay, I'll give that a try. So I ordered a gratitude journal, and I just got it from Amazon, put it on the shelf, didn't touch it for three months. I have no idea why. What is the point? I've done that before. Got a book, and then it just sits there. But then I start picking it up, and I think one day, I think I better start writing in this thing. And I started writing in it. And if you hear nothing else I say today in my hour, hour and 15 minutes, what have you, would be to pay attention about the gratitude journal. Because I noticed things started to change. Things started to happen in my life because I started focusing on everything I was grateful for and had in my life versus what I didn't have. Now, I've left out a lot of stories, but it'd be very easy to tell you a bunch more that happened to me to think, that guy is one unlucky son of a gun. <laughs> Well, I think I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. I went down and spoke to a uh, Lutheran Emmanuel church a couple weeks ago. About 25 guys from 30 to 60 had nowhere to live. They were all recovering addicts. And except for a couple of scary guys, average people, nothing. Just the clothes on their back. And they're in this church, and they gave them a meal, two or three a day, a bed, and then they tried to transition into apartments. I talked for a half hour. That's probably the most common sized talk I do. They asked me questions for an hour and a half. I was there for two hours. And as I walked to the car, I once again thought, you are one of the luckiest guys in the world. And yet again, I could choose that other road. I added a module recently called the T in the road. You can't go straight anymore. You either go left or you go right. Left is my way. Gratitude, gratitude journal, appreciating what you have in your life. Right is the same old nonsense. I don't want to be your friend anymore. I don't need it. It's too easy. Yes, ma'am. No. No. Great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. The easy. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it was if, if you have someone in your life who's not really very good for you, a good person or whatever, is it good for you to be grateful for the little or the few good things that they have? Does that sound about right, Danita? More or less? No, because I think of all the cliches that have ever come out in this world, my number one by itself, all alone, and number one is you can lead a horse to water. You can't make people do stuff. You can't make a knucklehead into a good guy. All you can do, Danita, is turn that and be as grateful as you can for you. And maybe that means making a better decision. Maybe it's no longer with him or her or whatever it might be. The more you get strength, the better you like that person in the mirror, the better you get connected, the more confident you are. Being grateful will do it, the better your life operates. Now, I don't always tell this. It just sort of depends on what mood I'm in. But my brand is the gratitude guy. Well, how in the heck? Should I be cynical or sarcastic or any of these? Oh my gosh, what's wrong with that guy? We listened to him speak and now he's like bad mouthing somebody. So I don't do that. But I got depression from my mother. And it pissed me off. Something fierce. And Brenda mentioned her son. So I tried some pills and stuff. And then what, what killed my wife? Pills. I'm not doing that crap. I'm going to figure out something that's going to help me. So once I got the gratitude and I got the gratitude journal, I'll get back to this in a second, but I will tell you what happened to me. It was actually up here, was at the Burlington Chamber, Mount Vernon, or uh, Rotary, I think it was Chamber. I woke up, and we're gonna talk about one to 10 in a minute. 10 is the best day of your life. One's maybe one of the worst days of your life. That's the number you're gonna put in this journal. If you do, great, if you don't, it's okay. Get your own journal, get a notebook, I don't care, but do something. I woke up that day, I was at two. That's only a half a notch ahead of the day I was when Dana died. I don't know what happened. I was depressed and I was kind of knuckled. You know, it just, it all go, it's like when you wake up in the middle of the night. Do you, you ever think about how great you have your life? You start thinking about your old money and this and that, and I got to go through this, and it's just like it's never good between three and four. <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased, you know, and I just, the head hits the pillow, and oh, now I'm going to be tired tomorrow, and I'm going to go to bed earlier the next night. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but you know what? I didn't even take a shower that day. Before I left, I went right down. I took this gratitude journal, and I drove down to Starbucks, and I wrote my gratitude journal. It takes seven and a half minutes. That's all this takes, seven and a half minutes. Bumped me up to about four or five. I was better. 
just from writing in the journal. Then I drive up to Burlington, and I do a talk, very nice group of people. And again, I feel very blessed when I get to sit there and sign books and talk to people and hear these stories, and can you come and speak to our group? It's just really, really wonderful. Beats the heck out of Nordstrom or Lowe's or anything, by far. So I was done, and this lady comes up to me, and she's crying. And I get a lot of people that get emotional, when they because I can relate. I went through the same thing. My wife, my husband, my father, my brother, my son. Sad that I'm offering some hope through a healthy coping mechanism and not these destructive ones that are out there and they're so prevalent. So she comes up to me and she says, can I give you a hug? Now, there's no ring here. Being single, I'm always looking for a hug. <laughs> so, of course, I'm going to say yes. And every swap, hey, 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 well, I, sorry, sorry. And I, <laughs> and I uh, she says, my name is Janet. You just changed my life. And she's just crying. And she started, I said, can you tell me? I said, thank you. you. You just made my day. Can you tell me why? No, I can't. It's too personal. A couple of the stories you told. And, and she said, and again, this is never my point. If you want to get a gratitude journal, great. But that's not. I just want you to do something that can get this on paper. And she said, I want to get a couple of gratitude journals. And I need to get this and so forth. So she gave me another hug and thanks, and, and I gave her a card, and I think she'd had a situation with her son, too, and I said, if you want me to get him a latte, I'd love to. I get up to Gadget Watkins County about once a month. But I walk out to the car, and I get in the car, and I sit in the car, and I have a smile on my face. Now, it's funny to sit and smile when nobody's looking at you. <laughs> it's strange. It is strange. And I thought to myself, you ever wondered who your best friend is? Well, you, may, you may know, but if you ever wonder, who's the first person you call when you get really good or really bad news? My definition, that's your best friend. Well, for me, it's my little Connor, who was four and is now 19. Oh, and I did forget one very, very key part of that story. Now, I know you can't see this very well, but that's a picture of Connor. Connor is six foot two. He became the starting pitcher of the Bothell High School team. Yay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I use it as a bookmark on my, uh, my journal. He's now down in uh, San Diego going to college, and it just it breaks my heart. I can hardly talk about it. I miss him a lot. But he's doing very, very well. But I sat there, and I thought, I'm going to call Connor. Because he would have been the person I wanted to tell first. But then I thought... Do you realize what number you are now? Now I was a nine. I'd gone from a two to a four, five, six to a nine. And I didn't take one pill, snort one thing, drink this, do this, all this nonsense. And I've been around so much, it's just ridiculous, as I said. And then I did something that's kind of embarrassing, but I like to tell it from time to time. I didn't kill Connor. Oh, for God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How unprofessional. Can you cut that part out of there? I took the rearview mirror and I turned it towards myself as I was getting on I-5 South. And I just looked at myself with a little smile and I went, I'm so fucking proud of you. <laughs> You're out there doing something. You know what I used to do? Where are the hammers and nails? I ran the Lowe's store. Oh, that's important work in this world. You got the six penny? How, how do I know? I, I wear a suit. I don't know about hammers and nails. But I realized we all have to, we'll all figure out our legacy someday why we're here. I'm a lot closer to that end than I am to that end. But I thought about it and I thought how that made me feel on that day that I got to impact her life and since then it's been many many more and I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. I did a uh, nursing home about a week after that church. It's about 20 guys. I'd say average age, average age 80 to 90, probably pushing 90. There's about 20 of them here. Here's our speaker today, Dave Rook. Guy looks at me, when's lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, we'll get to the food as soon as we can. I have a little message for you here. <laughs> but they said, let's stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Mr. Brook is our guest. Will you lead the Pledge of Allegiance? I think three guys could stand up. And look at all these faces. And I said to Rebecca and probably to Judy and 
Dini, I don't know who else I was talking to. That's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint. I like to do this. I like to see who's looking, and I don't like the, it, sometimes it doesn't work and all this kind of stuff. There's, there's tons of ways you can use it, and it's great, but I like to look at people when I'm talking to them and to see the looks in these faces and all the stories. And he said, that guy was a World War II bomber. That guy was his pilot, and he was the navigator. It was just really cool, and I got to hear these stories after it was over. But the reason I bring it up again, all the tragedy that I was around, I walked to my car again, same thing. Luckiest guy in the world. That's what I felt like. Gratitude journal. I decided to make my own. I got it on Amazon, started writing it, started seeing all these changes. But I came up with what I just mentioned. Now, this is almost full of mine, but pretty simple. Day and date and daily number. I mentioned daily number, 1 to 10. Current events and special occasions, a couple of lines. That's just so you don't have to have a diary. You can talk about it. I had coffee with Judy Bradley, or you just kind of relates it, you know, but you don't have to, you have to have a bunch of these things. I am so grateful for these lines. You can do each individual line or every other. It doesn't matter how big you write, just so you do it every day and develop momentum. I think most of us brush our teeth every day. They look at mine and people look at, is this yours? Oh, you write it every day. Did you hear what I just said? Were you at the talk? I said, yeah, I just brush my teeth three or four times a week too. It develops phenomenal momentum. Down here, the highlight of your day. Just a quick thing. If it's a time like now, maybe it happened this morning. If it's in the morning when I typically write in mine, what happened yesterday? A little quote. Then on the right-hand side, Gratitude intentions. What are you going to be grateful for? What are you planning to be grateful for? Your subconscious brain does not know the difference between what you think is going to happen and what happens. It's a phenomenal part of your seven pieces of the brain, individual brains. I would left uh, this other company and I was running this real fancy bridal boutique. Kind of reminded me of my Nordstrom days several years ago. And of course, I'm writing in my journal every day comes up to July 17th, time for my new contract. I meet with her and she goes, uh, it's not working anymore, sorry. Would it be okay if this is like your last date, like today? <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Uh, I guess, you know. Yeah. Well, we'd like to take you out for a drink later on. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I want to have a drink with you. Um, I said, okay, July 18th. Every single day I started writing, I'm so grateful for the job I'm going to have before the end of the year. I wrote it faithfully every single day. Now, depending on the job you have, you know, fast fooders, and you know, I get that in a day or so, but, but the bigger job, I run big box stores like Nordstrom's and Lowe's, as I mentioned. You've got to be realistic. I started writing every day. December 30th, 9 o'clock in the morning, I get a call from Lowe's. We'd like you to run the Mount Vernon store. I looked at my journal and went, wow, I've been writing that every single day. One day to spare. Got it for the end of the year. Started there about 10 days later. But it does work. But here's what my quote is in the beginning of this journal, which I feel very passionate about. If you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. You have to write about it. I have an app. I refuse to sell it. My phone, which has gone off a few times, I apologize. I'm so grateful I had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, Diane and Linda today. Who types it? You just hit, and there it is in my journal. I'm so grateful for the opportunity Judy Bradley gave me to come and speak to this great audience. Who types it. It's not the same, you know. I, I'll, I sell a few of them, but it's about writing. If, if writing didn't work, why would we take notes? Why wouldn't we just listen to the professor and just go back? And so it's very, very important. So I'd like to just take a poll for a second. There's no more standing up or anything to. I thought what Galen did was cool. I don't get embarrassed anybody, hopefully. Certainly is a great exercise. One to ten. Ten is the best day of your life. As I mentioned, one is the toughest day of your life. I want you to think about your number right now. Now you can use halves if you want. But I want you to get your number. You're not going to have to write this down. So if you got that number planted in there, here's what I want you to do. If you're a one to a five, don't raise your hand. You don't have to make eye contact with me or anything. But just, just try to enjoy the rest of the seminar. But by a show of hands, if you got that number, how many people here are six? Okay, a few. How many are seven? Okay, a few more. How many are eight? 
the larger chunk. And how many are nines? Couple. And any tens? Two. What's your name? Link David. Link. L I N C. L I N C. What a cool name. Short for Lincoln. <laughs> I, I actually graduated high school. And <laughs> what's your name? Carrie. Carrie. Thank you, Link. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. Now, you got a pad of paper here. I'm going to give you three minutes on this one. I want you to do three things. You might think, eh, you know, I'll, get, I'll go two minutes on this one. Oh, anybody need a pen? Sorry. And pads? Up front, pads, pens. I thought everybody had the pads. Okay. Anybody else? Any pads, pens? Okay. Need a pad, Galen? Okay, here's what, I, here's what I'd like you to do. Actually, I'm not even in the time. I just, I'll give about a minute for each one of these, maybe 30 seconds. Number one thing, you can put number one. I want to know the unequivocal number one thing you're the most grateful for in your life at this very moment. Not yesterday, at this very moment. What are you more grateful for than anything else in your life? And I'd like you to write it down. And I'll give you about 30 seconds to think about it and write it down. Okay, number two, same thing, second most important thing you're grateful for in your life or second thing you're most grateful for in your life after number one. Okay, last thing, number three, it is around 4.30, it could be today, it could be yesterday, today's not quite over, I want to know the highlight of your day, nobody's going to see this, this is for you, of course that's a positive, what was the best thing that happened to you today, and if you can't think of today, think of yesterday, the number one thing, if somebody said, tell me about your day, and every once in a while I get an interesting group, can we write down the low light, no, no, this is, this is, we're not going that direction, this is a highlight, best thing that happened to you yesterday or today. Okay, stop. So just do me a favor, indulge me on this. Just look at them and reread those three one more time. And just think about what they mean to you. Okay, now, I'm gonna come back to one and 10 again. 10, best day of your life, one, toughest day, one of the toughest. One to five, don't answer. How many people now are six? Seven, wow, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, I can go home. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I need to be wealthy so I can just come out and hand out the $20 bills. There's only been once or twice that hasn't worked. For those of you that didn't see that, there's a couple of tens. I think it was Link and Kerry, and on that, after that exercise, there was about 10. That's how easy it is. Because you know what you're doing? You're focusing on what's good in your life. And as I love to watch these nodding heads and the people that have gone through things that make me shudder when they tell me after a presentation, I go, well, good for you for, like, for really realizing what is good. And I noticed, just like that day at the Burlington Chamber, when I'm in a funky mood, down, low, blue, depressed, anxiety, all those words, I write in this, it always bumps me up two or three numbers. You can't help it. 
And even as much as I miss Connor, I'm so grateful that he is happy, healthy, and self-sufficient. He's down in Colorado, going to Colorado, down in San Diego, going to school, which is exactly what I wanted. They didn't want him calling daddy every five minutes. But it works. It's phenomenal how it works. And I know that uh, a lot of people have ways they cope. It is a healthy coping mechanism. There's so many deadly ones, so many destructive ones. So, okay. So what I want to do, I'm going to do a couple more things, and then I'm going to wrap up. Oh, I do want to mention one thing. And think about this. What was the name of this? Better Your Business. So we're talking about business. <coughs> intentional Mindset Seminar. I'm talking about giving yourself an intentional mindset that you can change. And just think about that exercise. Now, you guys, just because I decided at the last minute to have you write it down because I knew you had pads, a lot of groups I haven't just think about it. Well, that's okay, but it's not the same as when you write it down. It starts with this thought up here. It goes into this heart, arm, hand, pen, paper, and you write it down and you see it. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today. It's written down. You can go back and refer to it. I will look at tough days in my life. Don't look at the gratitude journals that often. I got them all stacked up. I must have 20 in a row. They last about, mine last about three months. I'll go back and pick a day that I remember was tough and just see how I got through it. And guess what I did? Grateful for my health, grateful for Connor, grateful for Kyle, grateful I get to speak to people. I feel I've been like blessed to have this opportunity. Nothing against Lowe's, it's just that's not what I was meant to do on this planet. But you gotta focus on that, it'll make a big difference. Okay, so here's what I'd like to do. I got a couple more things to do and then we'll wrap up. I'd like you to take out your business cards if you would. And we are gonna talk about gratitude in corporate America in the last couple of things I talk about. And before you hand them in, and if I can get uh, Judy, I want to do two things. Number one is I do a lot of life coaching. And people ask me every so often, how did you get from where you are to where you are now? Well, I've had a lot of good coaches along the way. So what I did is I became a life coach, and I looked for people that wanted to be coached. Not needed to be coached, or not felt they needed, but wanted to be coached. And so what I do is I do a 30-minute complimentary coaching consultation typically over the phone to see if it might be something that might fit so if you're interested in that put a C on your card just put a circle around it that's one thing the second thing is is every Monday at 7:45 in the morning I send out a gratitude video two minutes long and if you want to be on that list uh, great if not put an X on your cards I don't want anybody getting it that doesn't want it I've got almost 400 videos now and to this day the same people that asked me about how the circle changed. Well, how do you keep thinking of new ideas? Are you kidding me? I did a video once on my furnace because I was so excited I was toasty and it was cold out. I was grateful for my furnace. I mean, I thought it, it's, it's an infinite list. Oh, that's, it, that's an interesting one. And I go, so, um, oh, so, so go ahead and, and if you would collect those cards, I'm going to pick out and we'll do a book. And as I said, if you'd, like me to sign it, <coughs> I'll be happy to. <laughs> I'll understand. I'll understand if you don't. I think John Grisham's at Barnes and Noble, and that may be more powerful. Yes, I will, Carrie. Okay, thank you. I'm going to get $20 bills. I'm telling you, I, that's the next step for me. So I guess there you go. And then they'll, they'll all catch on, and they go, tell them to sign the book. It'll give you 20 bucks. But I will say this one thing while she's collecting the cards. I didn't bring it with me because I sold out of it. I did a book called Ready, Aim, Captivate with some really, really cool authors, Deepak Chopra, and a bunch of really people that are my heroes. And um, I remember when I first heard about it, it was over six months they wanted to get these stories. And I sent in 26 different stories, kind of based on the videos, but just different things around the gratitude guy. And uh, I got rejected. And on the 27th story, ironically enough, it happened to be about uh, the day that changed my life, the day that Dana died, September 29th, 98. I remember seeing the email, you've been accepted. And I thought, boy, another example of not giving up. And again, I will tell you for a second or third time and maybe one more time before I wrap up, I cannot tell you how fortunate I feel to be up here because 90% of the people have the stories they're just not the ones that get to come up here. Either they don't get to do it or don't want it or what it doesn't matter. But I can just tell when people look at me, they've experienced a lot of this. And I just continually say, here's a way to deal with this, which is pretty doggone healthy 
it is not going to cost you your life. James Eubanks. Who's that? Okay, let me just embarrass James. Uh-oh, X on the back. Just kidding. Psyche. Did Carrie say that? She did. Congratulations, Thank Mr. You Eubanks. Much. You're welcome. And I will sign that if you want, whether you like it or not. No, that's good. Okay, so I want to do a couple more things. I've got about five minutes. So I just want to wrap up in a couple of things. Gratitude in corporate America. I do a lot of talks to corporations and they say to me, well, what, how does this gratitude stuff relate? I'll tell you exactly how it relates. Again, to the business owners or whoever. 25 years ago, the surveys that came out for people were, what did they want in a job? Top three things. There's top ten, but top three. Appreciation and recognition, help with personal problems, being in on the no. Those are the top three. Those have now moved down to like eight, nine, and ten. Appreciation and recognition is still pretty critical, but the number one thing the new surveys say that people want in a job is purpose. They want purpose, they want responsibilities, and they want goals. And purpose is the same reason why somebody leaves a six-figure job at Microsoft to go work for Wikipedia for free because they want to enhance the information on the internet. But I've noticed when I manage people, I've managed as much as five or six hundred people in those big Nordstrom stores. Lowe's, that was 150 over there, 200. Managing people, raising children, exact same skill set. Set a good example. I told Connor, I never smoked and drank and did drugs and all that kind of stuff. And I said, I admit, Connor, I'm a tough act to follow. But you'll never see me around any of that kind of stuff. You got to set a good example. Well, one of the ways you do that is being grateful for your employees, grateful for yourself for your life, for your boss, for the owner, the manager, director, doesn't matter what the title is, but that's how critical it is, and in my opinion, it's just that simple. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick, because this is not mainly what we're talking about today, but I did like the fact that the golden rule directed me as good as anything ever has in my life. You treat people the way you want to be treated. I still don't understand why people don't get that, that idea. Last thing. Sharing gratitude, that's the fifth one. And when you think about the things that have happened in your life, I remember I wanted to go skydiving. So, any skydivers here? Terry, good job. Uh, free fall or static or tandem or static, same with me. Eight guys lined up. So we get to Sunday, then it was about a week out, it was about seven. And it was down about six. And then the Monday of that weekend was five. By Wednesday, there was three. And on Friday, there was two of us. And we, so we agreed, we'll just meet out at Issaquah, the two of us that were left. And of course, guess who showed up? Just me. Nobody was there, from eight down to me. They all chickened out. Of course, to listen to them, they'd tell you it was whatever. But anyway, I went ahead and jumped. Static and oh, scary, scary. But I did it. But there's nobody to share it with. So I got the pictures. I'm like Connor waving to me from second base. Like, <laughs> and they're like, who's the guy smiling? There's no friends with him. He's got no friends. I said, of course, they all bagged out on me. But it's so important when you get something to share it. It's back to what I said about when you find somebody in your life, who's the person you're closest to? That's who you call first. One more example. I learned how to fly. Got the chance to be a pilot a lot of my life. Don't fly as much anymore. But I was a visual flight rules pilot and I was caught between two cloud layers and you're not supposed to be there. I was down at ocean shores and all of a sudden I was in these two clouds and oh, this is not good. But then the sun came in from the beach and it hit these two cloud layers and it just made these colors like a freaking unbelievable kaleidoscope. Kind of like that scene in 2001, A Space Odyssey, whoever happened to see that. I'm going about 150 knots. I'm just hanging on to the yoke. My eyes are like this. And it's just going like that. I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm just hanging on. And then it must have been 30 seconds. It felt like about five or six minutes. Then bam, I pop out. And I'm back out in the open again. And there's the water. There's the sand. The sun's coming in. And I turn to my right. Was that not the coolest thing you ever, did you see the colors? Did you see the, when the silver came in and the blue and then that red shot across there and, and, and I was flying by myself. I never forgot that. Nobody ever, no matter how I describe that to you, nobody ever got to share that. 
I just have to describe it to somebody. But that's what happens with gratitude. Anything in your life. I'm just using gratitude today. When you get it, you want to share it. Rotary. I'm a big member of Rotary. Speak to a lot of Rotary clubs. Service above self. Well, when you're depressed and you have all these things that happen to you in your life, you can get a gratitude journal. There's not a day I miss writing in this gratitude journal. I realize the old adage, you want to help yourself, help other people. But you got to be strong. It's awful tough to build a skyscraper with a weak foundation. If you're going to add extra stories, extra floors, whatever, and you're crumbling, get yourself right first, but then help other people around you. It makes such a big difference. I will tell you from the bottom of my heart, and I can't get any more personal than this. Gratitude not only changed my life, it transformed my life, and in many, many ways, oh, it gets me choked up. It could probably save my life, and it can save you guys as too. Thanks a lot. Come on, Mark. Stay there. Stay there. Haley, will you come back up on up here? We just want to take a moment to thank you again for Most welcome. Um, being part of this event. And um, I am so grateful that both I've met both of you and um, that you both agreed to come and uh, share with us today. Because you guys God, he's taller than me. <laughs> I'm not used to guys being taller than me. Very impactful yeah, messages very from both of thank you. you. Thank you so much. And so one of the things that we, we traditionally do is give a bottle of wine. Now, if you don't drink, you can pass it along to someone else. I'll take but, both of them. Well, we just happen to have, um, we just happen to have some sparkling wine for you. Compliments thank you. of where wine shop can Thank you. Your oh, business. better your business. So, you. um, okay, so... Here you get you get you do in the center. Yeah, you better you do go in the center because that'll work. Because <laughs> that'll look funny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can okay. I can I do something with mine real quick? Sure. So Link, Carrie, you're both the first two tens, right? Number between one and ten. For the record, it was for the record, it was four. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much, and don't go anywhere. We have a couple of other announcements, and um, oh yeah, we're going to be doing that here at the networking. Um, so if you.